Welcome back. Time now for that tribute that I've been telling you about, and that will be on shortly. But before that, uh, two tributes that have come my way. One here from Mohamed Nyaoga, the chairman of the Central Bank of Kenya, says that it's heartbreaking to learn the demise of a good friend, a super CEO in the world. I've personally known him for a long time. Condolences to the entire family, Safaricom, and the country. This is from Mohamed Nyaoga. And to the chair of the National Olympic Committee, Dr. Paul Tergat, he says that I learned with deep and profound shock the sudden passing on of the Safaricom CEO. I mourn the loss of an iconic leader, mentor, and patriot by all means. May God comfort the family, Safaricom, and all of us. Well, time now for that tribute that we've been telling you about. We leave you with that even as we wrap up the Monday report. There it is. You know what I'm finding funny? What? The fact that you're looking at a blank screen. <laughs> there is actually nothing. And I'm reading statistics, on that right? Screen. <laughs> Isn't that cool, though? Is that cool? Back. Back. <laughs> Welcome back, man. I mean, we were, we were uh, many of us, your friends, and everyone out there. We were very worried, and um, obviously, you discovered you had cancer. I had been feeling unwell for a while. Uh, you know, Caprona Catoni came to see me when I was in London and he says, we just thought you were getting boring. <laughs> I said, Kip, it's because, you know, you're skipping, you know, functions in the evening yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. So I was feeling tired. Um, I was running temperatures from time to time, but the temperatures didn't last very long. So it'll last like 24 hours and then I'd be okay. Um, uh, when I was finally diagnosed in London, he said, you probably had this thing for about six months. So that takes me back to the first, the first symptoms I saw when I was in Morocco. Uh, I went to something there. And um, I had this kind of fluey thing. I noticed, um, a strange thing, I noticed a pain in, my, in the bones of my shin, which is not something you, you experience unless you kick something hard. And so eventually I was in Chamonix and I had the shakes, you know, I was really like this one evening. And um, my wife on board said, I think you've got malaria because she's really, really good at self-diagnosis. Um, so she called her mom, and I'm going to get into serious trouble when I get home tonight. She called her mom, and yeah. her mom said, yeah, it's probably malaria. Go get some, some medications. And, um, but anyway, and, you know, I finally went to a doctor back here in Nairobi who, um, who said, I think you're vitamin D deficient. Here are some supplements. And I said, Look, okay, um, let me go see a proper doctor. So I went to, um, to Dr. Silverstein at uh, mm. Nairobi. And he ran a series of tests. He said, because I don't know. So he did about 30, I remember the number now, 30 different blood tests. I know that because it cost me $1,000 uh, just for the test and I had to pay there. You know what? Yeah, 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 you're right. And he said, look, I, um, I don't know what the problem is, but I need some more tests. So I need to admit you as soon as I can. It's actually the first time I'd ever been admitted in hospital. And so I went in on the Monday and uh, he said, I need to do a bone marrow aspirate. I didn't know what that was. I said, sure. I said, it sounds painful. He said, be fine. And so they actually take some bone marrow out and they test it. And he said, ah, okay, so I think um, you have a problem with your blood. Um, I'm not the expert on the subject, um, so I want to refer you to an expert. But I need to get you out of here pretty soon. And I said, well, sure. I mean, you know, I've got the... Uh, the elections are coming up and mm -hmm. you know that was a, mm -hmm. a fairly noisy time and then I've got the year end coming up the week after that so I'll go soon after that he says no I think I mean I'd like you to go like tonight if I can so then you start to think well maybe this is a little bit serious mm. so I went to London and um, the diagnosis was a thing called acute myeloid leukemia which is a, a rare form of blood cancer uh, but curable so I, I met a fantastic um, hematologist there, uh, Donald. And so Donald talked me through it and he says, look, you know, I think the, the thing with this disease is that it's a little bit late onset and usually people are not fit enough to go through the regime that I'm going to put you through. He says, I think you're fine, you know, your heart is fine, your lung is fine, your kidneys are fine, your liver is fine. So I think we'll, we'll put you through this. But it's going to be, um, it's going to be a little harsh. I said, look, how long is it going to take? He says, mm, realistically, he says six to nine months. And, and you know, that was the biggest shock. So being diagnosed with, with cancer 
for me it actually wasn't such a big deal. Um, a lot of people seem to think that that's a bit strange, but for me it was, you know, you, you got cancer, you got cancer, you know, you can't undo it. He says a security program, but it'll be six to nine months. Um, and I thought, um, this is going to be tough. Uh, so he says we want to start the chemotherapy as soon as we can, uh, which is in the next couple of days or so. So then you had to tell people, you know, I came back and I told the team, well, I came back, I, I called the team and told them, and then we start to put stuff in place. Uh, the interesting thing was when I said to my wife that I'm going to London, she says, oh, okay, when are we leaving? I said, you're coming. She said, well, of course I'm coming. I said, right, so when should we book your return flight? She says, the same time as you. <laughs> I said, well, we don't know how long it's going to take. And I, I, honestly, I thought it was going to take at that time, yeah. maybe eight weeks or so. Uh, so she says, no, I'm coming. I said, what about everything here? She says, no, we'll fix that. Um, and when we were told it was six to nine months, you know, being a, Saf a Safaricom person, you know, we would then think, yeah, but we can probably do it in five. <laughs> <laughs> in half that time, yeah. Uh, so it actually turned out to be nine months and two weeks. So acute myeloid leukemia, leukemia yeah. which means what bone marrow trans so what it means uh, is that the um <laughs> bit of an expert on the subject now yeah. it means that uh, you know your, your your cells in the blood they start out as uh, stem cells and then they grow and they, they become what they call blast cells and from there they either turn into red cells or white cells and what was happening is that they weren't moving from being blast cells they were just staying like that so my white cells weren't being produced and if your white cells are not being produced, then you can't fight infections. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is why I was getting this, this kind of shakes in temperature. Uh, so the first thing you have to do is you have to get rid of the, the blast cells, which are the cancerous cells. So they put you through two cycles of, of chemotherapy. And um, they, it's like three chemotherapy a day for 10 days, uh, which is a, a bit harsh. But it's not as bad as people who are doing it like every few days. And you and I will remember the young lady, um, Rose. Yes, who was, Nesimiyu. Rose Nesimiyu, who yeah. was doing it like every few days. And yeah. you know, you go through this huge dip. Yeah. Whereas I didn't have a chance to go through the huge dip. You know, um, three times a day, the chemotherapy is in there. Mm -hmm. And you just have to kind of brace yourself. And after the second, uh, the second cycle, um, it was fine. You know, I was in complete remission. Which took me to about January, February, I think. And then I said, good, now we go home, right? He said, well, you, you can go home, but if you go home, I will guarantee you that in six months' time, which happens to be right about now, he says the cancer will be back and it will be worse than it was when you came. And then I don't think that I can put you through a curative program. I think that we're just going to have to maintain you on chemotherapy. You know, you, you, you're taking it very lightly here that, you know, you went through the chemo and all that stuff, but it must have been scary for you at some point. I mean, there was a point when you think, okay, so I might not come back. Uh, and then um, <laughs> you look at um, you look at the options because you know I'm, I'm one of the people who believe that when I die, actually I want to be cremated and pretty quickly. So that long drawn out process, and uh, figured out that the average cost of a funeral in Britain is about three thousand dollars, which is probably about four and a half, but whatever in, in shillings. Yeah. Um, so I kind of figured that out and decided that uh, I really must get my affairs in order. Now, a colleague of mine, just before I was diagnosed, uh, Barak, Barak came to see me and he was diagnosed with stage four lymphoma. And, um, you know, being a CEO, I kind of give advice. And I said, okay, Barak, so I don't actually know anyone who's died of lymphoma, which is true because Rose had lymphoma and she, and she, she was fine. My yep. sister had lymphatic cancer and she was fine. So I said to Barak, you'll be good, but make sure that you put your affairs in order knowing damn well that I didn't have my own affairs in order. So that was something which I had to do fairly quickly. But for sure, I mean, at some point, yeah. because it's a, it's a terrible word. And everybody who's told that they've got cancer responds in a very different way. And, you know, my hematologist said to me, you know, how did you feel when you were first told? Yeah. I said, well, Panis, you know, I, psychologically, I'm probably a little bit deformed because I was, I was okay. You know, you've got leukemia, you've got leukemia. I said, what really upset me was when you guys told me two things. You, the first one is you said it's going to take nine months and I thought are you crazy you know there's a company to be <laughs> to, to be, be managed back home yeah. Yeah. and there's a family and stuff yeah. so that was the first thing which really upset me mm -hmm. and the second thing is when you told me that I'm you know post transplant I would have uh, an extremely high chance of a relapse yeah. I said I've kind of come to terms with that now and you know the science is really working pretty well uh, but being diagnosed with leukemia wasn't I wasn't upset about it I kind of Somehow I kind of expected it. Hmm. Is it hereditary in your family? Or I mean, you, you're 60, right? 
Why do you have to tell everybody I'm 60? <coughs> so I look so, 45. Yeah, okay, you're 40. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm 60. So, yeah, so, and it appears now late in life, Bob. I mean, is it in your family? Do you it have usually a, occurs a little bit later. Yeah. And this AML occurs usually at about 65. So I contracted a little bit early. It's not a hereditary thing. Um, nobody's quite sure why it happened. How are you feeling? How's your health right now? I'm feeling pretty good. Um, you know, the drugs help. Um, you've <laughs> Everybody says, you know, you're, you're, you're beating cancer. You're Actually, what you learn to do is you learn to live with it. Uh, and I've just decided to make friends with it. So, yeah. Are you friends? Me and my doctor. My doctor, who I, I don't know whether she's listening or not, is the most fantastic person in the world, apart from my wife. Uh, and she's been doing a fantastic job. You know, so we're, we're working through it. And I'm, I'm feeling fine. No, but you know, I'm, I'm, he was surprised. He was surprised to see me walking down the street. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I'm not as active in the gym as perhaps I'd like to be, um, but I'm still on the treatment. I mean, that's and you know, the whole handshaking thing, which causes me embarrassment several times a day because I I, I can't shake hands because infections spread. Bob had, had informed us, so we knew that uh, he wasn't going to last very long. He, he had been told by his doctors not to make any long-term plans. Mm -hmm. In fact, he was told if he makes it past July, he'll be lucky. He this knew. is it. Yeah. So he, I have never seen anyone prepared for death like I did this man. <laughs> 